I invite you all to get settled and just to arrive. We're going to give folks a minute or two before we jump in tonight. It's really an honor to see some familiar faces here. Hi, Dickie Joe. Nice surprise. Welcome. I'll try not to be nervous in your esteemed presence. Um, it's so good to see all of you. And I know that uh, it is a holiday weekend um, that many of you have been moving about with family or friends or community. And um, so I just really deeply thank you for taking the time out to be here tonight. And as folks are gathering, I want to just invite you to have a mug of tea close by or um, as I like to call it, my emotional support water bottle, whatever type of beverage you can sip on. And um, as things arise, as things come up for you, just to have that with you. Um, hydration, uh, if you were with me a couple of weeks ago for our eclipse and retrograde class, I mentioned that hydration is such an important tool to help us when emotions are arising and when these celestial energies are influencing us to move through um, and allow them to move in our body and through our body and not get stuck or stagnant. We're gonna give folks just another minute or two to gather. And as we do, I invite you to uh, drop in the chat and leave a little message of where you're tuning in from tonight. We had some folks joining us from Florida and Vermont and Vancouver and uh, someone signed up from the UK, although I'm not sure if the time zone will allow them to be here with us, but we've got folks from all over. And so I imagine that we're all Zoom pros, now, but if you haven't seen the chat pop up, you should see a little button near the bottom and just invite you to drop in and let us know where you're tuning in from. If you have any questions tonight that you're hoping that we can cover, welcome those. And some of you emailed those in advance. So thank you so much for that. If we don't get to all the questions in our hour together tonight, then I'm uh, gonna invite you to send me an email at moonmedicine at sagemountain.com, which I've also just dropped in the chat. And I'll leave that again later in the night so that uh, if there's anything that we leave untended and don't get to that, uh, you'll have a chance to send those in by email later. I'm coming to you tonight from unceded Abenaki territory known as Central Vermont um, from Sage Mountain Botanical Sanctuary, which was the home and teaching center of my mentor, herbalist Rosemary Gladstar for the last 30 years. And I've had the deep privilege of uprooting myself from the swamps of Central Florida to find myself here for the last few years. Um, in central Vermont, in Dakina, the unceded Abenaki traditional lands. And um, so I'm tuning in from the top of a mountain. And as some of you, including my neighbor across the meadow, uh, might experience um, in a rural area, sometimes internet is not always as strong as it might be in the city. And sometimes in the city, it's not that strong for that matter. So um, if I get interrupted at any point, please just drop a note in the chat and let me know and I'll slow down or reboot, try to make sure that we are delivered as smoothly and gracefully as possible tonight. If you were with me two weeks ago, you know that we are still in the final days of Mercury retrograde and that trickster can often uh, show us weaknesses in places of technology and communication. Uh, we're also in the new moon tonight under the sign of Gemini, which is ruled by Mercury. So there's lots of great communication themes that we'll talk about tonight, but also some trickster energy might still be lingering these last few days of Mercury. So um, please slow me down or interrupt if I start to sound like a robot and I'll do my best to correct that, but hopefully it'll be smooth sailing tonight. So if you have topped in in the last few minutes, I just want to welcome you here and thank you for taking the time out of a holiday weekend and a Monday evening and a new moon at that to be present with us. Um, we'll be together for about 45 minutes or an hour. And my intention tonight is to share both from an astronomical and an astrological perspective uh, what's happening in the cosmos, sort of a celestial forecast for the week and for the weeks ahead um, with a real focus focus on the new moon tonight, which is in the zodiac sign of Gemini. So we'll talk a little bit about the new moon influence, the Gemini influence. We also are at the tail end of Mercury in retrograde. So whether or not you were with me a couple of weeks ago for my retrograde course, we'll be uh, diving into kind of what the influences of this remaining week will bring us. 
Once we leave Mercury retrograde on Friday, we'll be entering Saturn retrograde on Saturday. So we'll have a whole several months of fun with that planetary influence. So we'll talk about that. And we also have a conjunction uh, that we have been seeing in the sky before sunrise the last several uh, mornings uh, of Mars and Jupiter, which are both situated in the zodiac sign of Aries. And so we'll talk a little bit about that influence astrologically, as well as uh, how we might be able to see it in the morning if we have clear skies. Um, and then finally, I'll touch on the uh, Tau Herculid meteor shower, uh, which is peaking uh, tonight about midnight Eastern time zone. It is either going to be a bust or it's going to be the most blessed celestial show that we've had in a meteor shower in uh, quite some time, many, many years. And we won't know until our planet starts to uh, fly through the tail of that comet debris in several hours from now. So I'll share all of that with you uh, in our next hour. We're all on mute because we have kids and puppies and cars outside and various noises that might interrupt, um, but feel free to leave a message in the chat. If you have a question that comes up, if I start to speak in terminology that you're unfamiliar with, please slow me down. It's always my intention with these workshops that we start from very basic levels um, and build upon those. So those of you that are esteemed astrologers in your own right, or have been hobby astrologers for many years, or are students in my moon medicine course, or were with me for our workshop a couple of weeks ago for the full moon eclipse. Some of what I uh, shared tonight may be review for you, and I thank you for your patience there. But nonetheless, if you have been my student a long time, you know that I really value repetition as a learning tool. So hopefully if concepts or teachings are familiar with you to, for you tonight, that they'll still land in a place that's valuable for you to connect with them. Um, again, I just want to welcome you and thank you. I'm going to invite you to have a cup of tea or water with you and to remember to hydrate and sip on that throughout the night. I'll remind myself the same as I uh, teach and get that dry mouth to take some sips and pause throughout the night. Um, I'm coming to you from unceded Abenaki territory known as Indakina or called in modern times Central Vermont. Uh, from a place called Sage Mountain Botanical Sanctuary and a little town called Orange, Vermont, situated about 2,500 feet elevation in the middle of an 80,000 acre roadless forest and feeling very blessed to be tuning in from a place where I have the blessing of very dark skies and great moon gazing all, all year long. Um, I know that some of you are familiar with astronomy or astrology, and some of you are totally brand new. So again, we're going to start with some basics tonight and build upon them. Um, and whether we talk about these phenomena from a spiritual or a scientific perspective, there's a long history that, um, that teaches these celestial phenomena and the energetic influences that they can have on us as humans, as well as all life on planet Earth. And so again, tonight we're going to talk about the new moon in Gemini and those influences, as well as look at some of the other celestial events happening this week, like Mars, Jupiter conjunction, the Tau Herculid meteor shower tonight, and our closing out of the week with Mercury leaving retrograde and returning direct at the same time that Saturn starts to move retrograde. It's my sincere hope that you don't just find uh, tonight's class interesting, but also that you can glean some practical guidance to make the most of the celestial season and to buffer some of the challenges that these energies may bring, as well as to glean and harvest as many blessings from them as possible. Now, at the outset, if you're new to my teachings, I want to mention that I practice tropical or Western astrology, which considers the spring equinox as the start of the celestial cycle for the year. This differs slightly from Vedic or sidereal astrology, which uses what's known as a fixed star or fixed point to calculate the annual zodiac cycles. Uh, there are generally some slight inconsistencies between the two systems, and neither is wrong. It's sort of just like interpreting the sky from two different languages. Um, and so I share that at the outset, because if you have a biodynamic gardening calendar or have had your Vedic astrology chart done, some of the zodiac sign placement may differ just slightly between those two systems. Uh, generally, they are translating the same phenomena and the same uh, energies, but just in, like I said, a slightly different language. 
So I'm coming to you teaching from what might be known as the tropical or the Western astrology perspective. As much as I love to study astrology and have incorporated it into my work as an herbalist for decades now, both my uh, clinical work when I see a client and evaluate their health and their body and plant allies that are aligned with them, as well as my garden and when it's a good time to plant seeds or when it's a good time to harvest. I also come to this practice from a scientific or an astronomical perspective. If you've been a student of mine for a while, you know that my father was an astronomy professor. I uh, passed away about two years ago and is watching all these beautiful celestial events from some plush box seats in the sky. Uh, but I come from my astronomical science perspective, quite honestly, having followed along with him as a young child to his college classes, as well as being dragged out with mattresses and sleeping bags and thermoses of hot cocoa in the middle of the night, years upon years as a young child to witness things like eclipses and meteor showers. So when I bring forth teachings about astronomical and astrological phenomena, I'm really trying to weave together both approaches, both the science and the spirit, and find some way that we can dance between the two. Because I imagine that for many of you, you're interested in some of these emotional or esoteric aspects of how the stars affect us, but we're also living in a very linear scientific culture. And to be able to weave the two together is where I really find the magic and the medicine of these teachings in my own life. So for those of you that are totally brand new to this topic, um, I just wanna give a brief uh, recap of the the um, behavior of the moon. And when we're talking about a new moon, kind of break down what that actually means. The moon I think of as our celestial sister that's orbiting around the earth in a cycle that takes about 29 and a half days to complete. And during that cycle, the moon is reflecting light from the sun back to us on this planet. So the moon isn't actually generating any light of its own. It just reflects the light of the sun. And the angle between the moon's position and the sun's position in the relationship to our planet Earth determines how much light we see reflected off the surface of the moon. That's something that we call lunar phases. When the moon and the sun are conjunct or at zero degrees in their alignment with the Earth, then there's no light from the sun reflected. And what we see is a dark moon or a new moon. And that's what we'll see tonight. We won't actually see any moon in the sky. But conversely, about two weeks from now, when the moon and the sun are opposite or 180 degrees in their relationship, in their alignment, then the surface of the moon will be fully illuminated and that's what we call a full moon. The period between the new moon and the full moon, when the portion of the moon's surface that's illuminated is growing is called the waxing period. So from tonight, the new moon, two weeks as the light grows towards a full moon, we call that the waxing period or the waxing phase. Halfway between that two week period, is what's called the full quarter moon. So if you look up and you see what looks like a precise half circle, that's called the full first quarter in the waxing period or the waxing phase. And two weeks from now, when we get to that full moon and then the light on the surface of the moon starts to decrease towards the new moon, that lessening period is called a waning phase or a waning period. And halfway between that full moon, lessening down to a new moon is called the last quarter moon. So the new moon and the full moon, as well as these waxing and waning stages, carry specific physical and energetic influences. And we see those emotionally, we see those in our creativity, we see those in our physical health, we see those in our relationship, but we also observe these influences in all biological life on this planet. Scientists, for example, have documented how animals breed or migrate around certain lunar phases, plants um, germinate or bloom around certain lunar phases. And of course, humans are also affected. If any of you have ever worked in an emergency room, if any of you have ever worked in a, at a fire department or a police department, you likely know that there is an increased incidence of accidents and births at the time of a full moon. 
So we have this long and storied documentation of how the moon is affecting us as well as all other biological life on this planet. Think about tides, for instance. Most of us learn in elementary school the way that the tides of the ocean are influenced by the moon. Um, the moon's orbit is not perfectly circle around our planet. It's slightly stretched out on each end. So it's a little bit flatter in the middle, a little bit, <laughs> excuse me, more pointed on each end. And that means that as the moon is spinning around the earth, there's a time when it's a little bit closer, which is known as perigee. And then there's a time when it's a little bit further away, known as apogee. And every month, every 29 and a half day cycle, there's a perigee and apogee that happens as the moon completes its orbit. Sometimes that perigee, when it's closest to the earth, falls in alignment when there's a full moon. And it did this two weeks ago, closely to that when we had the eclipse and it will do it again two weeks from now at our next full moon. And when there's a perigee in alignment with the full moon, then that's when you hear all the media talk about a super moon happening. And that wasn't hundreds of years ago, an astronomical term, but uh, sometime about 40 or so years ago, that was a term that was coined to, to mean when the full moon is uh, aligned with that part of the moon's orbit that's closest to us. So the moon doesn't actually change in size, but when there's a super moon, when there's a full moon at the orbit perigee, then the moon appears when it's rising about 14% bigger than it might other times of the year. So keep an eye in two weeks when you watch that full moon rising, it's going to appear from our planet a little bit bigger than it normally might. So that's a little bit about new moon and full moon and the phases. And again, I know for some of you, this is old hat, but for those of you that are brand new, I wanted to bring that forth so that you can understand what a new moon even is. It basically means that the moon and the sun with their alignment to the earth are at zero degrees or conjunction, which means that there is no visible moon tonight. We might call it a dark moon or a new moon. And that's what we're looking at tonight. In terms of energetic influences, when we think about this cycle of new growing or waxing to full, waning or decreasing back to new, that returns over and over every 29 and a half days, we often consider many traditions, Eastern and Western alike, consider the new moon the start of the lunar cycle. And from an energetic or an emotional or spiritual perspective, it's considered to be a new beginning. So the new moon might be a time that you set a new intention, or it might be time that you start a new project, or it might be a time in your garden that you plant a seed or plant some seeds in the case of me here in spring in Vermont with our very short growing season, furiously trying to get them all in the ground. Or it might be a time if you're an herbalist and you make medicine where you start or set a tincture that you're gonna let macerate for a lunar cycle or so, and then harvest again at the full moon. New moons are generally this period of incubation and of starting and of, of growth and of beginning. And you can think about it very much like the light that's reflected off the surface of the moon. We see this darkness that's growing for a few weeks. And then we see this brightness, this culmination, this peak of light at the full moon. And then we see it kind of shrinking back to start the cycle again with the new moon over and over. So if you just apply that sort of reflection that we see of the moon's light of growth, and then of returning inward, of going outward and upward and rising, and then kind of returning to the earth and rooting or going within ourselves, then just right there, you can think about a way that we can bring the movement of the moon and the behavior of the moon into our own life, into relationship. So in addition to the new moon and full moon in that 29 and a half day orbit around the planet, throughout that almost month cycle that the moon moves around our planet from planet Earth, when we watch the moon in the sky, we watch it move across a path known as the ecliptic, which is the alignment of 12 constellations known as the zodiac. So when you, when someone walks up to you in a bar and says, what's your sign? They're talking about your Zodiac sign. They're talking about what Zodiac sign were you born under? And there are 12 of them and they are categorized 
in alignment with the four elements, air, earth, water, and fire. And each, the moon, as it moves across this path every 29 and a half days, it passes through each of these 12 signs for a period of about two to three days. It's not precise and it's not consistent. It varies week to week and day to day, precisely because of that um, orbit that's not perfectly secular, that, that um, perigee and apogee effect. So roughly every two to three days, the moon is changing through these 12 signs. And I mentioned these 12 zodiac signs are conferred a element, earth, air, water, or fire. Um, and there are other uh, sort of aspects, modalities, uh, cardinal or fixed or mutable, yen or yang, day or night. There's all sorts of unique traits that each zodiac sign is assigned. But for now, I just like to think about the elements because I think those are the really practical um, aspect of zodiac signs to study as we get started and also are somewhat second nature for most of us. They're the elements that we see in our environment so we can relate to them. We don't have to get super heady or memorize things. We can kind of relate to that energy. So every two to three days, the moon is moving through uh, one sign and then another and another following the path, starting with Aries all the way through the calendar year back to Pisces, all the way through the zodiac circle or wheel back to Pisces. And each of those signs is conferring a particular energetic influence on the moon and on us on this planet. So the moon as a celestial body has a very specific influence that it plays on us as humans from an emotional or energetic or mental or spiritual level. And that is that much like the body of the moon reflecting the light from the sun, the moon is kind of our inner reflection. It is our expression of our emotions. It's our, our intuition. It's our inner world, our, our sun sign. Like if someone goes up to a bar and says, what's your sun sign? You're like, oh, I was born in March. I'm a Pisces. That's your outer expression of the world. But your moon describes how you feel the world. It's the inner movements. It's not how you're walking through the world and expressing yourself so much as how the world is impacting you internally. What are your emotional responses? What are your um, emotional reflexes or reactions? How do you feel the world internally? So this particular moon that we're under tonight, the new moon is in the zodiac sign of Gemini. And Gemini is assigned the element of air. The symbol for Gemini is the twins. And this speaks to the propensity for this zodiac sign to present itself in somewhat of a duality. It, it shows us both sides of a story. But that also means that it can kind of feel like we are being pulled in two different directions. This moon might have us feeling like there's those two little fairies sitting on each shoulder whispering in our ears different messages. And we can tend to bounce back and forth a little bit from one thought to another. Or under a Gemini moon, we might be feeling indecisive, or our mind might be feeling somewhat uncertain. And as with some of our other air signs, we might feel scattered as the air itself. Gemini as a zodiac sign is also the seat of curiosity. This air sign asks us to question everything, and that can sometimes leave us feeling confused, but there's always a deeper purpose underneath that uncertainty. When we question the truths that we know, they, we only grow closer to the ones that are actually steadfast. When we question what's being expected of us from outside of us, from a relationship, from work, from the greater culture around us, as well as when we start to question what we expect from life in return, it propels us to move out of complacency. We no longer sit or stay very long in places that we've just been settling for. We start to feel an initiation or an activation into stepping into our authentic self. And that includes questioning parts of our life that don't really feel in alignment, but we may have been sitting in for some time. With this curiosity and with this sort of duality that we feel in Gemini, we also are really 
infused with a sense of flexibility and versatility. And this is a really good thing because if we are sitting here with curiosity questioning things around us, we're also given the strength to be flexible to those answers and make changes. Gemini is a real change-making influence. And I think this is really auspicious tonight with the new moon because for those of you that were with me two weeks ago at the eclipse and the start of retrograde, we initiated a lot of change with the full moon eclipse two weeks ago and with the solar eclipse two weeks before that. And this new moon in Gemini really symbolizes the close of the eclipse season. Now, if you were with my class, you know that eclipses will affect us for months on end. Anything that was seeded in that time will be blossoming in our life long forward. But the initial impact of the eclipse is sort of winding down. We're sort of tying up that energetic influence with tonight's new moon, but we're also being infused with this flexibility and this versatility of Gemini. So any of the seeds that were planted in the last month as we've been moving through the eclipse cycle, anything that's been prompted or initiated to change in our life, we now have this extra boost or oomph to respond to that and to make changes. So I was just talking to a student earlier today who had been unhappy in her job and through the Mercury retrograde eclipse cycle, she ended up being let go of her job very unexpectedly. And normally she, that would make her feel very insecure as it would many of us. But the Gemini new moon has really brought her today. After all this upheaval of the last few weeks, she woke up today feeling like, yeah, I can change and I let's change. Let's do this. Like she had that attitude of let's do this. And that's kind of what I, I am describing when we're thinking about Gemini and that flexibility and that activation towards making change in our life. It doesn't mean that we're all walking away from our jobs and our relationships and grabbing a back and, you know, spending six months hiking through Nepal, but just means anything that has been stirring within us for making change in our life, minor or major, we really have this new moon right now to support us stepping into changes that are healthy for us, that help to correct unhealthy patterns or habits or ways of relating, and that will allow us to step further into a, a more authentic version of ourselves. Now, the new moon or the dark moon usually calls us into stillness. It's a moon that I, it's a part of the, the monthly cycle that I often feel really introverted, but Gemini new moon is a little bit different. It feels a little bit excited or busy. This moon's helping us get things done. I mentioned it's the change-making moon. And it's also a little bit more social of a moon than other new moons because of the influence of Gemini. Part of Gemini and its relationship to the planet Mercury when it's influencing a moon is communication. And we often find in Gemini moons that we really benefit from communicating with others, from talking things out. So if you are like my friend that I described earlier, if you're feeling some, some unsettledness or some stirring or some changes from this recent eclipse that we've just moved through, this might be a helpful time to pick up the phone and you know phone a friend, use the lifeline, talk something out with a friend. Oftentimes through that conversation with others, we are able to see answers reveal themselves. Now, Gemini is also a very informative or information filled influence. And I mentioned those like fairies on either shoulder and they're both whispering different sort of information to you at the same time. Sometimes in Gemini moon, we can feel and Gemini season, we're now in the sun season of Gemini too. So the moon and the sun influence of, of Gemini right now we might feel like there's a lot of information streaming in, both from a worldly angle and from a ethereal realm, from an intuitive impression or insight. We might just be feeling like we're getting a lot of information and it can feel a little bit like information overload. Um, it can certainly feel difficult to concentrate or to focus or to make a decision because we feel like there's a lot of information coming in. And that's okay. I encourage you to be patient with yourself if you're feeling that, to watch for signs, to not close our eyes or ears or heart off to information that might be coming. 
to practice intuition as much as we can, aligning with our intuition, um, to document information that's coming in. This is a great time to journal. If we're feeling like really heady and there's a lot coming at us, just jot it down in a journal. It could be an idea, information from outside of ourselves, intuitive impression, all the things I'm rambling to you tonight in this class, whatever it may be, all that information, I encourage you to journal, to jot it down, to give yourself a place that you can let that information land that's not in your head so you can feel complete with it and that you can return to it when your mind feels more clear. I also want to encourage you to, in, in terms of Gemini and communication, to remember that our words cast spells. That's why we call it spelling. And the things that we say are meaningful. The things that we tell ourselves, our internal thoughts, as well as the, the communication that we have with others. And especially as we round out this final week of Mercury retrograde, which is such a trickster in communication and can be so much at root for misunderstandings that we might have in our correspondence, this Gemini new moon, especially, I encourage you to be really mindful of your communication, really mindful of your internal communication and what you tell yourself, but also the words that you speak to others. Give your emails an extra glance before you send them uh, to think about how they might land. Or if you have a difficult conversation that you need to have with a loved one or a friend or a partner, um, give yourself a little extra time to pause and just be clear with those thoughts before you jump into communication. Because our words, again, they I, I think of them as casting spells. That's why we call it spelling. They have meaning uh, and we that's an energy that we, we speak out into the world. So we want to be really thoughtful about that. So... I want to share a couple exercises that I lean into in this Gemini season to kind of help me um, integrate all that information and, and all what can feel like uncertainty or indecision and to also really be clear with my thoughts and my words. And um, I'm going to take a sip of tea and invite you to do the same. And if anything that I've shared so far, if you have a question or a thought, please feel free to drop that in the chat. Thank you for following along on the tea sipping. Sometimes I say that in these classes and people just sit there and stare at me where I gulp my tea. So I like that this is a group exercise tonight. Y'all, thanks for playing along. So Gemini exercises, right? So like it's ruling planet Mercury, Gemini moves quickly. And that quick movement can really help us process change as long as we're feeling grounded, as long as we're feeling connected. But if we are feeling this fast paced energy and it's left unchecked, we can really spin out a little bit with our mental capacity and our anxiety can rise. I have to tell you that one of the things that I've been feeling right now is just that things, uh, I wish things could slow down so I could really process things and do work at my own pace, but things just keep to be moving really fast around me. So I've been really focusing on a couple things to support my body and my mind through this Gemini moment. Gemini rules the hands and arms. It also rules the lungs and the nervous system. So this Gemini energy is connected to the way we breathe and our regulation of our nervous system overall. So breathing as a practice that we lean into during Gemini moments can really help us process and integrate and navigate all the frenetic fast paced energy that we're feeling. I always tell my clients and students, it's better to really be consistent with your breath than to be inconsistent, but dive deep. So that means that it's better to give yourself five or 10 minutes a day of dedicated breath work than to feel like you have to carve out an hour and a half of breath work, but can, you can only fit it in once a week or once a month. So how I integrate it is the first thing when I wake up in the morning, before I get out of bed, I just sit up and I just focus on my inhale and my exhale. And I do the same thing for five or 10 minutes before I let my head hit the pillow. And then I know that I'm at least bookending my day. And by doing that simple, small practice consistently, I find that I'm more likely to remember my breath as a tool for keeping myself grounded and centered when I stumble across stress in the middle of a day. If I forget my morning or my nighttime practice, or if I've gone several days, I've not done it and stress comes to me in the middle of the day, I often don't 
remember that my breath is there as a tool, even if I don't have my herbs or my tinctures or my tracker cards or whatever, my crystals, my stones, but I always have my breath with me. And if I'm consistent every morning and night with that five minute practice, and there's all sorts of breath work out there. I know y'all have done Kundalini and Andrew Weil or this or that and in between, but really it doesn't have to be complicated. Just a real clear exhale and a real clear inhale and being intentional and mindful of your breath is a great starting point. I also then from there, think about how I can support my nervous system. I know lots of you on the call tonight are herbalists and have a litany of herbs in your apothecary that can support you and your nervous system. I am a dear deep friend of the herb Tulsi or holy basil, and I have holy basil tea every day and usually several times a day um, to help keep me centered. It's a nervine and an adaptogen and It just helps us cultivate resilience. It helps our nervous system and all of our physiology, our endocrine system to bounce back from the physiological effects of stress with less effort and recover more quickly. I also love herbs like chamomile to help me calm down at night and really nourish my nervous system. Those of you that live in a non-tropical climate, your nettle patches are probably up and bursting with their bright green radiance right now. Um, And so I've been doing a lot of nettles, some soups and teas and spring greens. And lavender is another herb that I really love for this season. And it also has a um, connection to mercury. So that mercurial energy connected to Gemini, connected back to my nervous system. I love just using lavender petals in a little muslin bag tucked in my pillow as a sachet or carry around in my purse and kind of smell it when I'm you know, out doing errands and feeling stressed about being out in the world during very introverted new moon time. So Anything we can do to support our nervous system is a real Gemini tactic to help us harness and process and not get overwhelmed by all that energy. I also use uh, a tool called brain dumping or mental emptying might be a nicer way to say it, but I, I do a lot of brain dumping during Gemini. Again, I mentioned you're getting a lot of information. Those little fairies on either shoulder are whispering a lot of words and sometimes they're conflicting. We might be feeling a lot of ideas and influences inside and we're definitely getting a lot of information outside. So I give myself permission usually once a day in the afternoon or evening as I'm winding down work to just dump every idea and thought and sort of stream of consciousness onto a journal or a piece of paper, just so I can get it out of here and it feels less crowded in my mind. And also so that I can tap into those ideas because when they first arrive, it might feel overwhelming, but once we move out of Gemini and we move into cancer or some of the other signs, we can actually use that information. We'll feel a little more grounded to be able to implement those ideas and those resources. So Again, to recap, Gemini is bringing us curiosity right now. It's also bringing us flexibility. We're at the end of the eclipse season and all of that change that was seeded and all of that stirring of the pot that happened in the last month with the eclipses, we can now use Gemini and the new moon to really um, initiate change in response to those seeds that were planted by the eclipses. And I also want to say, and forgive me for not saying this sooner tonight, there's obviously so much heaviness and heartache in the world right now. And I know no one, no matter where in the United States they live, that is not feeling touched by the tragedies that we've experienced in this country in the last several weeks, not to mention the personal and collective grief and trauma that we've been holding since spring of 2020 when COVID first arrived. And There's certainly nothing about our practice of reading the stars or looking at the signs that's going to correct or change any of this societal oppression or injustice or violence that we all know needs to be addressed so quickly and so dramatically. But I find in these moments where I'm otherwise feeling helpless that I can center myself and root myself again in a place of peace and in a place of of knowingness and groundedness when I look to the stars. I'm reminded in these difficult times when I look up to the heavens that it is such a miracle to be alive on this planet at even in this very tragic and troubling time. The 
the conditions that had to collide in this very rare moment for us to be living on this green world right now are not insignificant to say the least. And so I'm reminded of what a miracle it is, even in this difficult time for us to all be here right now. I also feel closer to my ancestors in spirit and in bone when I look up at the sky and I realize that I'm watching the very same stars cycle in the heavens that my ancestors have watched for millennia and that future generations will watch again and again. And it feels like the challenges that we're facing right now may never leave us and are getting worse by the day. But I find solace in the confirmation as stars cycle above my head and as the moon ebbs and flows and ebbs again, that this too shall pass. So in all of what I'm sharing tonight, I invite you to remember that when we need a shift in perspective, we can always look up and the stars may not provide us all the answers, but they do help us put our lives and these troubled times in some context and remind us what a gift it is to be breathing on this spinning rock that's catapulting through space. Our planet may be a mere speck of dust in the magnificence of the cosmos, but the forces that had to collide in perfect alignment to create the conditions for us to be here tonight on a Zoom call from all different time zones across Turtle Island is nothing less than remarkable. And I hope that these reflections can help us find courage to take another breath and wake up another day, just as that sun rising and that moon setting gives us the promise again and again of a new beginning. So that's the Gemini new moon and have a few more things to share before we close. Um, the first is Mercury retrograde, which we've been in for a few, a few weeks now. Um, many of you are familiar with Mercury retrograde, but just as a recap, the term retrograde comes from the Latin word retrogradus, which literally means backward step. And as that name suggests, retrograde is when a planet or a celestial body appears to be moving backwards in its orbit as viewed from planet Earth. Astronomers call this apparent retrograde motion, very specifically because the planet Mercury when it's in retrograde is not actually moving in its orbit, orbit in a backwards motion, but it is an optical illusion. And then as I shared in the workshop a couple of weeks ago, think about when you're stopped at a stoplight and what the car next to you goes ahead before you or you go ahead before them and it appears if you're looking out the window as if one of the cars is moving backwards while the other is moving forward or I was on a train a couple of weeks ago and there was another uh, train on the track next to us and we were moving slowly forward and the train next to us I think was stopped, but it looked as if we were sort of one was moving backwards and one was moving forward. So that's the same optical illusion that's happening on planet Earth as we look up at a planet in the sky. It's not actually moving backwards. It's just an optical illusion as a result of the crossing of the orbits and the different size and shape and speed of the orbits of other planets in our solar system compared to ours as we all move around the sun. So typically planets shift slightly eastward from night to night, drifting slowly against the backdrop of the stars in the night sky, but from time to time they change direction. And so Mercury right now is in that apparent retrograde motion and it appears from our vantage point on the earth as we're staring up in the heavens that it's moving westward. This baffled ancient astronomers, but now we know that it's simply an optical illusion caused by the motion of the earth and other planets as we all move around the sun. So Mercury has been in retrograde motion for a few weeks now, and it will be uh, going direct at the end of the week on Friday. And in astrology, when we think about periods of retrograde, it basically means that the normal activity governed by a planet moves out of the norm or contrary. So in the case of Mercury retrograde, here we have a planet that governs communication, travel, electronics, and other aspects of life. And when it goes retrograde, those things tend to be misaligned. Mercury, we often consider the coyote of the cosmos that plays tricks and causes mischief. It messes with our communication. It breaks our cars, it breaks our computers, our cell phones, our emails stop working, all these types of things. And the truth is that when Mercury is in retrograde or when any planet is in retrograde, it's not actually causing things to fail as much as it's revealing weaknesses that are already there. 
So as an example, a dear friend and colleague of mine struggled with computer issues all weekend. And it wasn't that Mercury somehow broke her computer, it's that her computer is actually really old, needed some software updates that she was ignoring. And finally, Mercury was illuminating these things that needed to be repaired. The same is true with communications or relationships. Mercury isn't trying to break you up from your boyfriend. It's just trying to show you where there are tensions or weaknesses in your communication or in your relationship that need attention. In Mercury retrograde, our focus tends to become more internalized and our pace slows so that we can see those weaknesses or those problems that lie beneath the surface. And it's been a wonderful few weeks for us to review and revise our work, to give extra attention to our editing, to um, review our correspondence, especially important exchanges one last time before we press send. A lot of us have found that we've been feeling the natural urge to organize our files and put them in order, whether it's all the clutter on our desktop of our computer or our actual physical files sitting in a pile on our desk, Maybe you've been feeling like it's time to pick through your closet and clean out clothes you're not wearing and drop them off for the donation drive or sift through your junk drawer and get it in a little more order. You may still be feeling that for these next few days. Mercury goes direct on Friday. And then once it goes direct, we move into a period where communication will start to feel more aligned. We'll have fewer misunderstandings hopefully fewer glitches in our schedule or interruptions in our day-to-day -day activity. Um, and we'll feel sort of on the other side of that movement. Now, Mercury is generally in retrograde for roughly three weeks. It depends a little bit each year on our orbit and its orbit and where we're at in that alignment. But on either side of that specific retrograde period is something that we know as a shadow. And astronomically, what's happening is that Mercury has been moving westward for a couple of weeks and it's going to stop and it's going to start moving eastward again. But there's a period, a section of the sky that it's going to be crossing over that it already did. So essentially it was moving eastward. It stopped. It went retrograde. It moved westward. It stopped. It moved direct. And now it's going eastward again. But there's going to be a section of the sky that it already crossed that it's gonna be crossing over again. And that's what we call the shadow period. And that lasts roughly about two weeks. It depends again, each year there's a little difference, but it's roughly two weeks. And then that shadow period, I find that it's a time that we are feeling those lessons of Mercury retrograde again. So if there's anything incomplete, if you still haven't updated laptop and you've been clicking the ignore button every time it pops up, you might do that now because those weaknesses still have the possibility of popping up. And any lessons, any clarity, any impressions that you received from this period of illumination, we have a few more weeks to kind of give them attention and tie them up before Mercury passes that section of the sky and then starts moving fully forward and fully direct. So Friday, Mercury moves direct. There's about two weeks that it's kind of crossing over that same section of the sky again before it's fully out of the shadow. But Saturday, June 4th, Saturn, a large planet on the outskirts of our solar system will be entering retrograde period. And it will stay in retrograde for a very long time. Mercury is only a few weeks because it's the smallest orbit around the sun. But Saturn's a very slow, large orbit on the outskirts of the solar system. It takes a long time to move around the sun. So it's entering apparent retrograde motion on Saturday. And it will be in retrograde until October 22nd. So several months, we will, see Mer we will see Saturn in retrograde. So where Mercury governs or rules things like communication or technology or transportation, Saturn rules things like authority, meaningful structures, including structures in our society, integrity, um, aging or elder hood. And when Saturn as a planet starts to move backwards in this retrograde cycle, we start to retrace our steps when it comes to these themes. And um, we start to see things resurfacing from the past, especially things related to history or tradition. Saturn retrograde is a time I was always taught to embrace a motto of older but wiser. 
So this is a period where we're, if we are, are in our croning years or our own elderhood, or if we've had a significant birthday and we're sort of kind of um, integrating our own aging, we can really embrace that as we age, we get wiser and, and sort of value that elderhood that often the rest of our society overlooks. Saturn is also, you might think of it as governing karma. So in periods of Saturn retrograde, we tend to find some rebalancing as it relates to trespasses of the past. Um, we may find it's time for paying our dues for hurts or harms that we have caused. And we also may find that those that have caused hurt or harm against us may come due for their repayment to sort of the karmic cosmic forces. We don't always see what others may be going through if they've trespassed against us, but they're experiencing it. And if there's a harm in our life or a hurt that we've caused that maybe we haven't come clean about, or maybe we have a lingering apology from an event in the past that we haven't really had the courage to speak, Saturn retrograde is a time that can unearth that for us and can help us rebalance things of the past. There's also these present themes of responsibility and family and career, and we don't have time to get into it tonight, but whether it's Gemini new moon or Saturn in retrograde and the sign of Aquarius, there's these universal themes like I've shared tonight. And then there's also these ways that these, these events, these celestial events may influence us influence us particularly based on our own natal chart, based on where the stars were in the sky at the time of our birth. So if you're looking for a little bit more input or guidance as to how events like new moon and Gemini or Saturn in retrograde may influence you, then you should look to where Saturn was in your chart or where the sign of Aquarius is in your chart, and that'll give you more detail. Again, Saturn will be retrograde for about four and a half months. So it's a period of time that's a little bit broader and longer, obviously, than Mercury retrograde. Those shorter retrogrades, we tend to feel their influences in that compact period of time really intensely. We may feel these themes of Saturn and retrograde and the sign of Uranus a little bit more broadly over these four and a half months. But we certainly will feel them on both a personal and a collective level. Um, so the final two um, events that are happening this week that I want to share, and one I mentioned earlier is the Tau Herculid um, meteor shower, which may uh, be a great treat for us tonight as we pass through the scattered remains of a comet known as SW3. It was a comet that was discovered in 1930 by some German astronomers, Schwachmann and Wachmann. Hopefully I'm pronouncing their last names right. And so we call this the SW3. It was the third comet that they identified. It was a very faint comet at the time, and it disappeared from sight entirely until the late 1970s. We started seeing it again. And then in 1995, astronomers realized that suddenly this comet became about 600 times brighter than it had been. And it was not just visible through special telescopes, but from the naked eye. And what happened in that sudden brightness was that the comet actually broke up into pieces. And since 1995, it has continued to shatter into more and more pieces. And so when that comet passes us again tonight, astronomers think that some of the debris will con come in contact with Earth producing a meteor shower. We're not certain exactly how this is going to play out. We know that the debris will end up streaking through our atmosphere. And we estimate that up to a thousand meteors per hour could be flying through the sky. They will be smaller than other meteor showers like the Geminids or the Perseids, but so it means they'll be more faint. They won't be those large illustrious fireballs that we know of, for instance, in the Perseid meteor shower, but we will still see shooting stars through the sky if we're lucky. And if we're really blessed, we might see up to a thousand meteors per hour. Now, unfortunately, 
there's no way for astronomers to be certain in their estimations of what's going to happen tonight. So all the best we can do is wake up around midnight Eastern time and go outside and hope for clear skies and hope for a starry show. It'll be happening from around midnight Eastern time until sunrise. So um, if you live on the West Coast, it'll be a little bit earlier in the evening for you. But I encourage you to either think about staying up or set an alarm and poke your head out around one in the morning and see what kind of starry show might be happening. Again, it might be nothing at all, but if we're lucky, we may see about a thousand faint meteors per hour in the sky. And to give you some perspective, the Perseid or the Geminid meteor showers in a good year, we see about a hundred meteors per hour. So a thousand is going to be a cosmic show of fine proportions. If it happens, I'm crossing my finger and toes that we'll get a view of it tonight. The other um, celestial viewing that we will definitely see, and we have seen for a few nights now, is the conjunction of Mars and Jupiter. Both of these planets are in the sign of Aries, um, which I don't have time to fully go into, but it brings a lot of passion and expansion to um, how we're feeling today and how we're feeling this week as they're close in conjunction. From an astronomical perspective, though, we see these two planets really close to the sky, almost as if they're one big planet together. And we can see them with our naked eye. We don't even need binoculars or a telescope about 30 minutes before sunrise, low on the horizon in the southeastern sky. And you have about two more mornings that you can check out that phenomena of Mars and Jupiter's in conjunction in the southeastern sky low on the horizon about 30 minutes before sunrise, and then they're going to dip under the horizon and we won't be able to see them for a while. Um, I use whole sign astrology, although there is a lot to Placidus astrology. I can't dive into that too much tonight, Caitlin, but I'd be happy to field that question later. And Janet, I hope that I gave you some insight as to that buffer day or what I call the shadow period um, of retrograde. Um, and I hope you all have enjoyed this um, preview of our moon medicine class tonight. I hope that the new moon in Gemini is feeding you a lot of motivation for being flexible in your mind and in your actions and sort of moving forth on any of the change that was seeded in that eclipse cycle. I hope that the last week of Mercury retrograde, as well as that few weeks of shadow period is really gentle and we can take some precautions and, you know, read our emails twice and back up our computers and all those things to make it a little bit more gentle on ourselves. Um, if there were any questions that I did not get to tonight that you'd like to chat about, feel free to send me an email, moonmedicine at sagemountain.com. Hopefully some of you also got to download the workbook for the new moon in Gemini and can carve out some time tonight or tomorrow to answer those journal prompts and start to, you know, brain dump, mental empty, get some of those ideas and impressions and information down so you can reflect on it later. Um, this is a preview for our moon medicine course, which is a year long series that we do. And we open it twice a year and the next one opens on summer solstice. And we have lessons every new moon and full moon and live gatherings on the summer solstice and equinox. Some of you are in that class and it's nice to see you showing up for our workshop tonight. Um, if this workbook or workshop piqued your interest, then I encourage you to check out um, moonmedicine.org to learn more about that class. The enrollment is opening tonight and it's only open now through summer solstice. And if you sign up in the next week, you get $100 off. And we also have payment plans. And everything I shared tonight is a lot of what we cover in that class. If you're looking for ways to deepen your connection between the plants and the planets, if you've been a hobby astrologer and want to know more, if you want to bring in that energy of the stars to benefit your gardening or your personal health or your creative work or your relationships, then I invite you to join us for that program. But most of all, I want to really thank you for being here and taking an hour out of your new moon evening to be with me. And I hope that wherever you are residing on this beautiful planet, that uh, we'll have clear skies and a cosmic show tonight for that meteor shower. Um, and I hope that you'll stay in touch and that we'll see you again. Many new moon blessings and thank you all for being here tonight. Take care and happy moon gazing. <laughs>